Let's give him praise. Amen. Woo. Come on, put those hands together. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Come on. Jesus.
trust in you. This is a song for the valleys, for the harder days. Something to remind me when I'm lost in my way. And even though it's dark right now, I know morning comes. Cause you're out of the promise, and what you say is now. And in the battle, when I'm surrounded, still my soul will hold to all you said. You're my refuge and strength, my essence. is a prayer for the desert when the road seems long waiting for the promise that is yet to I will remain confident 
hopefully you've been stirred during that special time of worship. You know, I love that we can always look back to see what God has done and what He has taken us through. Then with that, whatever we are facing right now, however long it's been, we can face it with confidence because we know that God can do it again. You know, I love that God's Word has the ability to speak to everyone, no matter where you are, no matter what season you're in. Whether you're in the mountain top of your life, or you are deep down in a very dark valley, or somewhere in between, God's Word can reach you wherever you are today. It's still relevant. And listen to what it says in Psalm 40. It says, I waited I waited patiently for the Lord. And I know many of us in this room and those watching online know what it's like to wait patiently for the Lord. Maybe you're waiting patiently for that personal breakthrough. Maybe it's got to do with your job or, or health or, you know, relationships. Or maybe you're carrying a lot of anxieties because you don't know what the impact of the new Omicron strain is going to look like, how it's going to impact your job, how it's going to impact your mental well-being, or even your family. But I want you to see what it says. And I believe that as we read the rest of it, this is exactly what God wants to do. And I know that God will not keep you waiting for too long. Listen to what he says. He says, he turned to me. That means God is giving you attention right now. God is giving your situation attention right now. And he says, and heard my cry for help. He pulled me out of a horrible pit, out of the mud and clay, and He set my feet on a rock and made my steps secure. And I believe that as we pray, this is exactly what God will do right now. He's turning your attention to you. So we're gonna just raise our hands right now as an act of surrender. And those of you watching online as well, if you can maybe put aside the coffee right now, raise your hand with us. Let us pray and trust that God is giving us attention. We're going to give Him our attention right now as well because He's about to do something special as we pray. Lord, we thank You, Father, for every need that's represented in this house, Lord, and everyone watching us online today, Lord. We know that You're turning to us right now, Lord. You're turning to our situations, Lord. You're looking to the things that we've been carrying in our hearts, Lord, the fears, the anxieties, Lord, the worries that we've been carrying, Lord, you're turning out your attention to us right now, Lord, to make a change, Lord, to make a change, Lord, to help us, Lord, to stir our faith, Lord, to, to just stir up hope again, Lord, and to give us a future that you have designed for us. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that you're making us secure again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, it's so wonderful, church, to have you with us. We love having people in the building. Welcome to everyone else joining us online. That's right. And if you're in the building today, um, you can take your seats, give someone a wave. And um, if it's your very first time joining us at a Rivers Church service, we just want to extend a very big welcome to you, whether it's in person or online. If it's in person, will you give us a wave? Let us know if you're here for the first time. Oh, that's awesome. Welcome, church. Give them a massive welcome. It's absolutely fantastic. We love having new people. And um, you will see a QR code come up on the screen, or if you're sitting, you'll see it on the seat in front of you. And it's just to, a link to a brochure. They'll tell you a bit more about our church, our vision, values, culture, just what Rivers Church is about. And um, we'd love it if you could also give us some feedback on how you enjoyed the service with us. And uh, hopefully you'll join us for another one in the future. Awesome. Yes, we'd love to see you again. And we just want to remind you, church, just let's continue being safe, being careful with our masks covering our noses and mouths. So we wanna keep meeting. We don't know what the future looks like in terms of you know, what the new announcements will be with all uh, the things that are coming up now, but we wanna continue meeting. So the safer we are, the more we'll continue meeting in church. That's right. Um, 
Also, this past Friday, we had our last Youth and Young Adults meeting for the year. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, we want to encourage you, if you've got um, kids in that age group, or if you are a young adult, to come along next year. But um, it was absolutely wonderful. We loved it. Can't wait to join again next year. Uh, but this week is our very last junior youth in-person service. So if you have kids that are in that age group, and be sure to bring them to church. You just need to book a seat for them in the building to join us in main church, but we would love to have them join with us. And that will kick off again in January. Awesome. And we currently are running our Christmas market uh, down. If you exit, go left and they'll left again. If you're in the building, just give it a visit. You, see, you can get some good stuff to, to give as gifts to your family, your loved ones. And if you're watching online, maybe it's time you pop into the building as well. Come and pick something up from the Christmas market as well. Yeah, great way to catch up on your Christmas shopping if uh, you're feeling a little bit behind. I'm talking to myself right now. Um, but a great variety of resources and gifts and goodies. And also we've just missed the resource center, so check it out and it's an absolute vibe. Well, Pastor Andre and Vilma are still away, but we are very blessed to have Pastor Devon, who will be sharing with us today, with a fantastic word. It's one of his last messages with us before he moves to Belito. But first, he's going to encourage us in our giving, so let's open our hearts as we continue to worship God. Fantastic. Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? Is there life in the house today? Is there life in every house online? Presumably so. So good to see every single one of you and wonderful that we can continue in our worship today. You know, this week many people would have been paid. And as we gather as the church today, it's an opportunity for us to honor God's responsibility or God's expectation of us to share our tithes and our offerings with Him. And I want to bring to you a story that we read about in the beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 8. And it's the story of Noah coming out of the ark. We, many of you may know the story. God saw all the evil in the world. He knew that he needed to restart everything. He spoke to Noah, told him to construct an ark. And inside the ark, there'd be a pair of every kind of unclean animal and seven pairs of every clean animal and bird. And so for a very long time, Noah built the ark and the rains came. And for about a year, Noah and his family and these animals lived inside the ark. But I want to read to you the very first thing that Noah did when he came out of the ark. It says, then Noah built an ark to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered a burnt offering on the altar. The very first thing that Noah did when he came out of the ark was to give an offering to the Lord. And I think that in this time of chaos that we've been going through, this time of challenges that many people have been facing, it's very important that we follow the example that we see in Noah because he wasn't living in an easy time and yet he still prioritized his giving to the Lord. And I think that there are three things that we see about Noah's journey and his decision to make an offering to the Lord that we should learn from as well. The very first thing is that he wasn't asked to give. There's no instruction from the Lord in that space where God says, I want you to give me an offering. No, the very first thing that Noah did when he came out was simply give an offering to the Lord. And maybe it was simply out of gratitude. Maybe it was purely out of amazement. Maybe you're thinking, oh God, I cannot believe how good you've done. But whatever it was, God didn't have to prompt him to give. And the same is true for us, church. You know, every week we do have somebody standing on the platform encouraging us in our giving because I think we do need a reminder from time to time. But I think that as we grow in our maturity and in our discipleship with the Lord, we shouldn't have to be reminded that, hey, it's the 25th this week. Let's make sure we set aside our tithes. Let's make sure we give our offering every week. No, we should just say, Lord, I see who you are. I know what you've done. And so my heart is welled up with a sense of generosity towards you and a desire to honor you. So here is what belongs to you. The next thing that we see of him is that he gave of the best. The word says that he gave of the clean, he gave some of the clean animals. Now, if it was me, I must be honest, if I were coming out of the ark, the very first thing I would have done is sacrificed the hardy dars. I would have saved the eternity from this, the pain, the trouble of the hardy dars. But that's not what I did. He gave some of the best of the clean animals. In the Bible, we see all throughout Scripture, people giving their first fruits to the Lord. It means giving the first and giving the best to God. Noah did exactly the same. He didn't give the hardy dars of his income. 
No, He gave the very best. And so too for us, church, when it comes to this time of the month and every time that we gather, we should be willing to give God the very best that we have when it comes to the end of the month, when we get paid, to set aside what belongs to Him and then go over and above that as well. It says that He gave some of the clean animals. There were 14. There were two pairs of, um, rather, there were seven pairs of every clean animal. It says He gave some of every clean animal. Some definitely means more than one, probably more than two means He gave more than 10%. He gave more than 10% of everything that He had. Church, we should follow that same example. And finally, the giving was contrary to the need. He gave of the very thing that was needed to fill the earth again. It didn't make sense for Him to sacrifice the very thing that was meant to repopulate the animal kingdom, and yet He still gave. And so often when we come to our tithes and our offerings, it might be like, it, it doesn't make sense to give my 10% every month. I've got these bills, I've got these expenses. It's just, it doesn't make sense. It's contrary to the need for me to give. And yet the Lord says still, give. Give what belongs to me because that's the very mechanism that He will use to bring incredible blessing into our lives. And we read not much later, and a couple of verses later, God then promises that as long as the earth endures, there will be seed time and harvest. This moment now is seed time, but it's the precursor to the harvest that God wants to bring in our lives. But first we must sow our seed and it might be contrary to the need, but if we honor God's instruction, we get God's reward as well. Hope that encourages you today, church. You can take a moment to prepare your giving if you haven't already done so. And just a reminder of the various ways that you can give through the Rivers Church app. It's quick, it's easy, it's safe. You can give via SnapScan as well. Some details will be on the screen. Give via credit card at the information counter or an EFT as well. Before the service started, I jumped onto my instant banking. I did a quick EFT, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But let's make sure, church, that we all do our part. Even for everybody who's streaming online, just because you're not in the building, it doesn't exempt you from partaking in this wonderful responsibility. Let's all play our part. Let's all do what we can do to build the kingdom. Amen. Let's pray and let's commit our giving to the Lord. Our dear Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of building your kingdom. We thank you, Father God, that we can partake in doing something that's gonna make a significant difference in many other people's lives and in our lives as well. So we pray today, Lord, that you'd bless every giver abundantly as they return to you what belongs to you, as they stretch ourselves, as we all stretch to give to you, and that we all know, Father God, that you are our source and you are our provider. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, Simi mentioned it. It's quite a special weekend for me and my family because on Wednesday, we will be driving down to Rivers Belito to go become the lead pastors at Rivers Belito. And at the same time, Pastor Adi and Pastor Claire will be traveling up to Rivers Kailami. And I've got to say, I don't think that Rivers Kailami is ready for the incredible, phenomenal, profound blessing that they're going to be having in having Pastor Adi and Pastor Claire as their lead pastors. But pray for Belito, because they are losing Pastor Adi and Pastor Claire, and they're stuck with us. Not necessarily a fair deal. But you know, as I look back at my time here at Rivers Church, I've been here for 18 years. I've been on staff for about 15 years. It's been a wonderful journey. And the message that I wanna share with you today in some ways encapsulates some of the most significant teaching that I've received while I have been here. And I'm convinced that it's gonna help you as well. Not because I'm particularly good at preparing a message. I'm really not. But I know that my message has, a, has the Word of God as its foundation. And the Word promises that whenever the Word is preached, it will not return to the Lord void. So as long as we're determined to receive, you may not like me, you may not like the message, that's absolutely fine. But if you're determined to receive, I know that God will speak to you, to your situation, as long as your heart is open. So won't you stand with me today? Let's pray and commit the word to the Lord and trust Him to speak to us all. Won't you put your hand on your heart? Our dear Father, we thank you so much that <clears throat> when we do come around the preaching of the word, that we can know for certain that you are speaking to us and that we can hear your voice. And that way beyond who I am and the message that I've prepared, you can speak uniquely to every unique struggle and every unique pain. And so we determine today, Lord, that we are gonna receive from you. We determine to open up our hearts. And I pray, Father God, that you'd bless me and anoint me to speak your word today. Lord, that it would be you who has seen and not me, that it would be you who has heard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may take your seats. I want to start the message today by sharing with you the story of a honey badger by the name of Stoffel. 
Stoffel the honey badger lives on the Maholoholo Animal Rehab Facility near Pretoria. He imprinted on humans at a very young age, and so he can't be released back into the wild, but he still has all the honey badger tendencies. Now, honey badgers are not pretty animals. They grunt, they snort, they're aggressive, they are very unglamorous, but they are particularly tenacious, and they don't easily concede defeat. So much so that Stoffel decided to pick a fight with a pack of lions, and he ended on the bad side of that fight. In fact, he had to be in hospital for about two months afterwards, and it's then that his owners realized that they needed to do something different to contain Stoffel so he doesn't get back into trouble again. They decided then to build an enclosure that they called Alcatraz. Let's have a look at this video. Just the way that many of us should be responding to the challenges of life, but simply we do not. What I love about Stoffel is that it doesn't matter what life throwed at him, it doesn't matter what tried to contain him or limited him, he simply refused to settle into confinement. He wasn't deterred, he wasn't discouraged, he didn't run out of steam, he just simply would not settle for less in life. You know, church, we have had two years of profound challenges. There's been a relentless amount of sickness, of death, of debt, of overspending, of loss of lifestyle. There's been anxiety, there's been depression, there's been riots and there's been looting, there's been natural disasters. There's been power cuts and water cuts and job cuts. There's been chemical spills and sewerage spills and that's just speaking nationally. Individually, people have been trying for a baby for years and years and it just hasn't happened. People have been unemployed for X amount of time and they just haven't found a job. There have been health challenges upon health challenge upon health challenge. Maybe your husband was caught cheating or your marriage is fizzling dry. Maybe your children have gone off the boil. I mean, we can be sitting here today thinking, when is it going to end? Well, it's, it's not. Hope you feel encouraged in church today. There is an endless supply of difficulty waiting for us in life, church. There's an endless supply of things trying to enclose us, trying to make us live small and believe small with a small faith and small hopes and small expectations and small dreams. They're always trying to cause us to settle for less in life, but we must have the mindset of Stoffel that says, I will not settle for less in life. And yet so often we do. So often people settle for a mediocre marriage because working at it has simply just not helped. And hey, at least we are not divorced yet. And so they settle just for mediocrity. Many people settle in a job that they're unhappy with because they don't believe that they're capable or worthy of more. A lot of people settle in addiction because, hey, at least I'm feeling something. Or they settle for illness because it's easier than exercise. They settle for a life that will always suck because I've never had a break. They settle for brokenness because wholeness costs too much. They settle that I won't even try again because COVID this and COVID that and COVID variants and COVID, 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 COVID. Church, my message today is simple. It is do not settle. Don't settle for happiness when there is joy. Don't settle for your experience over God's truth. Don't settle for good enough when we should be living in more than enough. Don't settle for limitations when we should be living in freedom. Don't settle for peacekeeping when we should be living with peacemaking. Don't settle for brokenness over wholeness. Don't settle for social expectations over God's divine call. Don't settle for anything less than God's ideal for your life. I love what it says in Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55 verse 2 says, Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, he says, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Ogmandino was an author and the um, author of The Greatest Salesman in the World, and he said, Never settle for the crumbs of life. So many people have settled for the crumbs of life instead of spending their lives for the bread of life. So many people are laboring endlessly for something that simply doesn't satisfy in life. There are so many people who have settled for something less, church, but there is so much richness to be had, so much joy in God's presence, so much hope to fill our hearts, so much purpose, so much wholeness, so much purity if we would just be determined that we will not settle for less. And in the face of many delays, in the face of the persistence of trouble, the disappointments and the failures, the shortcomings, all of which will never leave us and all of which will reoccur, we must face it 
and say what is the title of the message today, I will not settle for less. You know, there is a nonstop flow of things that will try to contain us. And like Stoffel, we must be determined that we will always shake those things and not settle for less. And I just want to share with you four simple points today that I believe that if we embrace these things, we will be prevented from settling for less in life. Is everyone doing okay today? Up in the balcony? Sort of. <laughs> Point number one. If you don't want to settle for less in life, firstly, you need to be clear and convicted of your vision and values. Do you have a vision for your life? And do you have a set of values that you want to live by? Because if you don't, you will inevitably settle for something less. We've all heard the saying that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. But I think the same is true with our vision and our values. If you don't believe in something and if you don't live by something, then you'll settle for anything. Our vision is where we are headed in life and our values is how we want to get there. And if you, both of them are very important because if you have vision but no values, you might get to where you want to go, but you'll have a lot of collateral damage in relationships and you'll compromise yourself and lose yourself along the way. If you have values but you have no vision, you may end up with many virtues but without any progress. If we don't have our vision and our values, then we will begin the slow decay of momentum and character making many tiny compromises along the way. But when we do have our vision and our values in place, then we are empowered to say yes what we must say yes to and to say no what we must say no to. I think this is seen particularly in the life of a key character in the Bible with his family, and that's the story of Abraham. Abraham is known as the father of faith, and he was called by God out of obscurity in Mesopotamia to head towards Canaan, which would become the land of God's people. But before Abram was called to go to Canaan, his father Terah had made that decision to travel there already. Now the Bible tells us that Terah was an idol worshiper. He had no reason to leave Mesopotamia where life was good, where life was comfortable. So why did he desire to go? Scripture doesn't make it clear to us, but knowing that Abram and Terah were from the descendants of Noah, from Adam, they knew who God was. Their family told a story about who God was, and though they had settled into idol worship, I believe that there was a desire in Torah to get back to who God was, a desire to know more. And there was a pull towards the land of God that he might discover him at a greater level. But we read this in Genesis chapter 11. It says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Okay, so big whoop. He wanted to go somewhere, but he settled somewhere else. No big deal. Well, actually, it's quite a big deal because Haran was actually the seat of worship in society for the moon god named Sin. Terah had a vision for his life. He had a vision for his future and his family, but his values weren't established. And so when he was tempted with a fragment of his old way of life, he simply didn't have the wherewithal to stop and to overcome it. Instead, he settled back into idol worship when he had a vision for where God had called him to be. Church, we must have a vision, and we must have values for our lives to, ca to carry us along the way. Otherwise, we will end up settling for a counterfeit of our faith, and we will forfeit God's plan for our lives. Who knows, church? Who knows what God could have done with Terah? Who knows if perhaps he was meant to be the father of our faith instead of Abram? But he settled, and so he didn't achieve what God had for him. Many people have settled into living with pornography or lust or affairs or illicit exchanges and toxic relationships because they've lost the vision of a strong marriage and they've abandoned the values of purity. Other people have settled into addiction to drugs or weed or booze or medication because they've lost their vision for wholeness and they've lost the value of sobriety. Maybe you've settled into a dead-end job with a boss who mistreats you and colleagues who to mistreat you and take advantage of you because you've lost the vision of your dream job and the value of perseverance and perhaps even of self-respect along the way. 
Church, we must have a vision and a value or we will settle for less. As mentioned, I've been on staff at church for about 15 or so years, and I've been in pastoral care, in the pastoral care department, for a lot of the time of those 15 years. And I can tell you without exception that January is one of the most predictable months of every single year, because that is the month when half the church turns into Britney Spears. Everyone comes back to church and contacts us in January saying, oops, I did it again. Oops, I fell into a bad habit. Oops, I slept with that guy. Oops, I snorted something I shouldn't have snorted. Oops, I did something again that I had conquered previously, but my values weren't strong enough to carry me through a month in December when my defenses are down. And oops, I did it again. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says that where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Another version says that where there is no vision, the people cast off constraint. Church, if we don't have a vision for our lives, we will perish. And if we don't have the values that we're convicted of to get us there, we will perish. It says that he who who has the law, happy is he. If our values are based on the law of God, on the word of God, then our lives will be happy and our lives will be strong. So I want to encourage you, church, especially as we come into a time perhaps of COVID with another variant on the loose, a time in December when many people set down their defenses, do whatever you need to do to remind yourself daily of your vision and of your values. Pick, uh, pick some verses that speak into it. Put in the dashboard of your car. Perhaps put pictures up that will remind you of where you're headed in life. Speak about it with your spouse. Speak about it with your children. Journal it. Pray about it. Speak to it with your friends. Teach your children about it. In our family, we've got seven core values that we have as a family. And whenever we need to discipline our children, we discipline them not out of yes and no, do this, don't do this. It's always based on our family values. So it's not a thing of stop killing your little sister. It's, hey, are you honoring? We we value honor in our family. Are you honoring your sister? We don't just say, share your food. No, we value generosity, so share your food. We are constantly reminding them of who we are as a family because we know where we want to go, but we want to know the, the values that we want to instill in our children. And we're not, going to, we're not going to raise perfect kids. I promise, I promised Belito that we would give them a lot of gossip to share when it comes to our children because they will make many, many mistakes in life, but that won't deter us from the vision that we have as a family and the values that we want to instill in our kids as well. It's one of the great values and strengths of our church. Our church is healthy and strong. Because at the very beginning, Pastor Andre and Pastor Vilma, our senior leaders, they laid out our 20 values as a church. It's in our partnership brochure, in our visitors brochure, it's online. The words are on the walls of our church. We have clarity about our vision and our values. We are clear and we are convicted. And the church staff, the church leadership, the church executive team, the church volunteers are made up of many, many different people, different backgrounds, different personalities and different temperaments. But we are powerfully united because we know together where we're headed. We know our vision and we know our values. So we're not going to settle to become a congregation of believers with a moral and an effectual decline. No, we will stay a congregation of disciples who will not compromise what we value so we can get to where God has called us to be. So be clear, church, on your vision and your values so that you don't settle for less. Point number two, is everyone okay? Point number two, accept that pain is part of the journey, but not the destination. Church, we must have a decent amount of room in our faith for pain and suffering. So many people abandon their faith because they can't reconcile pain and suffering with their expectation of life in having a relationship with God. There's a growing list of Christian leaders and musicians who say that they're now deconstructing their faith, typically because they can't get an answer to the question that if God is good, why is there so much pain and suffering? And I'm not here to try and answer that question for you today. Because if you are asking that question, no amount of human reasoning is going to satisfy that for you. You must humbly bring that before the Lord 
and allow him to take you on a journey of deepening and strengthening your faith to get the answer that will satisfy. So I'm not here to satisfy the question. What I am here to say is that nowhere in Scripture are we promised that because we have faith, we will have an easier ride. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that we'll have all the answers, that we'll be immune from pain and suffering, disaster and trauma. In fact, we're promised quite the opposite. In Scripture, we are promised that we will have persecution, we will have ridicule, we will have rejection, and we will have trouble. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We promise that in the midst of trouble, Christ still reigns supreme. But there are many people who... Perhaps it's because they face legitimate, terrible, painful difficulty, or maybe because they just stubbed their toe and they can't believe how God could allow such pain. Many people, because of pain, have settled into something less in life. But I want to encourage you with the life of Paul today, a well-worn scripture, which I have preached from before, but I think it bears repeating, from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. So far, all the scripture is telling us is that pain and suffering was very common, not just for Paul, but for all the believers. It says that he was working harder, which means that everybody else was working hard. Everyone else had been in prison. He had just been in prison more frequently. Everyone else had received a flogging. He had just been flogged more severely. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, not church. I've been in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. It sounds like he's describing parenthood of a toddler. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the concern of all the churches. Who is weak and I don't feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? I mean, at what point, if you were Paul, would you have stepped back and said, okay, I am now done? (laughs) Seriously, I've had enough. How was Paul able to withstand such repeated and relentless and ruthless hardship? Well, I I think it's because he knew and he relied on the grace of God. In the founding chapter, we read about the thorn in his flesh. It says, when I am weak, then I am strong. So he certainly knew the grace of the Lord, but I think he didn't allow himself to get so comfortable in pain and so comfortable in thinking, well, life should be a version of this. He had enough room in his faith to believe that there is going to be pain. So when he faced it, he wasn't shocked by it. Instead, he could face it and endure it. When we face pain and hardship, so many people abandon their faith or abandon their hopes or their dreams or their expectations before God has given them the opportunity to find the strength that they need to endure. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch concentration camp survivor, and she was responsible for saving many Jews from the Nazi, and she was sharing with a group of people an exchange that she had with her father one day. She said to her father, Daddy, I'm afraid that I will never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, her father answered, when you take a train trip from Harlem to Amsterdam, when do I give you the money for the ticket? Three weeks before? No, daddy, you give me the money for the ticket just before we get on the train. That's right, he replied. And so it is with God's strength. Our wise father in heaven knows when you are going to need things too. Today, you do not need the strength to be a martyr, but as soon as you are called upon for the honor of facing death for Jesus, he will supply the strength you need just in time. She said, I took great comfort in my father's advice. Later, I had to suffer for Jesus in a Nazi concentration camp, and he indeed gave me all the courage and the power that I needed. Church, God's strength and the timing of the strength that he supplies is not just for persecution and for being a martyr, it's for unemployment. 
It's for the loss of a loved one. It's for divorce. It's for depression. It's for whatever is causing you to doubt the goodness of God or to doubt your faith or to, def- uh, to doubt your capacity. If you just knew the strength that the Lord was waiting to provide for you, if you would just hold on a little bit longer and not settle in the face of pain and suffering and discouragement, the money for the ticket is right there, church. Just don't settle for something less in the face of pain and suffering. I love what Nelson Mandela said. Nelson Mandela said that there is no easy walk to freedom anywhere. And many of us will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintop of our desires. Now, church, this is why we desperately need the church of God. This is why we must not neglect meeting together in person because we cannot successfully and with significance uh, traverse the landscape of grief and pain and hardship in isolation. Just being in church, just being with a community of believers already gives us strength and gives us purpose. And nothing, church, absolutely nothing can replace the community and the corporate, respond, uh, the corporate accountability that we find in the presence of God with many other believers. It's why we must continue to serve. It's why some of you need to start to serve. It's why we must worship and teach our kids to do the same. It's why we must sing and engage and press in and respond in the services when we're here because all of these things help us to carry us and try to encourage us to push through the pain when pain tries to crush us. Don't settle for church online. Maybe you're not here today for a legitimate reason, but don't get comfortable with church online as if it is a good alternative. No, it's a prosthetic I haven't met a single person with a prosthetic limb who said, oh, I'd rather have this than having my real limb. Every single person who's lost a limb would say, no, I want the real thing. Church online is wonderful when we need it, but when we don't need a church, let's gather in person so that it helps us not to settle for less. Amen. (laughs) Point number three, embrace the final authority of God's word. We're living in an age of flick and pick Christianity where people try to customize their faith to suit their lifestyle. And there's no wonder that we're seeing an increase in divorce and addiction and depression and anxiety because society is no longer tethered to something that is permanent. You know, the world is always changing. It's always changing its standards. It's always changing its moral code. And so if you try to live according to the word, it means that you will always be changing and trying to keep up with something that never, ever stays the same. Reading from John chapter 8, Jesus says that to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold onto my teaching, you are really my disciples. If you hold onto my teaching, you are really my disciples. We should be cautious not to call ourselves Christians if we're not holding on to the teachings of Christ. It says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So many people are encouraging us to live your truth. But you know that there is no such thing as your truth. The scripture makes it plain that there is the truth. There's no such thing as your truth. There is God's truth and your experience. And the moment you elevate your experience to the level of God's truth, you are on very, very shaky ground. We must live according to the final authority of God's word. And many people are abandoning the truth of God's word because it's difficult. And it calls us to live at a higher standard. I love what James Garfield, who was, I think, the 20th president of the United States, he says, the truth will make you free, but first it will make you miserable. Isn't that the truth? That the word does call us to do things that are painful. It calls us to do things that are difficult, but it calls us to a level of living that can never be met by anything else. And the world does present an argument that seems plausible, That seems good. In fact, speaking from Colossians chapter 2, it says that my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you're looking for answers in life, look no further than Jesus Christ because he has it all. He says, I tell you these things so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. In verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition. You see, church, the world will present many arguments about life, about gender, about sexuality, that may seem very plausible, but in the end, it is simply not the truth. 
And if we settle for an argument that sounds plausible, we will have a faith that is shaky and very, very flaky. We must accept the full counsel of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's not human-conceived, it is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Church, all scripture is God-breathed. Not just the parts that we like, not just the bits that we agree with, all scripture. So even the scriptures that speak about the purpose and the boundaries of sexuality, even the scriptures that speak about the clarity and the purpose and the immutability on the nature of gender, male and female, as God created it, even the scriptures that speak about the destructive power of gossip or the expectations of husbands and wives and the dangers of trusting in and loving money, all those scriptures are God-breathed. And so we shouldn't just pick and choose the ones that we agree with and try to live only by those and neglect everything else. No, we must accept the full counsel of the word of God. Otherwise, we will settle for a life that might be socially acceptable, but it is still divinely compromised. If we embrace the final authority of God's word, we will not settle for a life that is compromised. And finally today, church, if you don't want to live a life that is settled, accept that mediocrity is never God's will. It is simply not in the nature of God to ever give or create or love at the level of meh. When God created the world, he did it perfectly. His creation is perfect. His love is extravagant. His provision is generous. His kindness is abounding. Just look at the way that he dealt with his people all throughout scripture and you will see evidence that God never does things in mediocrity. His character is excellent. So everything he produces is excellent. He is compelled by his character to act accordingly. And so every expression of who God is, is done at the level of excellence. Even when he created you and me, we were created in excellence. And because we were made in the image of God and because we were created in excellence, then what is coming out of our lives too should be excellent. We were not designed to live with mediocre faith, mediocre marriages, mediocre hopes and dreams and visions for our lives. We were meant to live in excellence. We were created in the image of God, and so we should live in that image. I love what Joyce Meyer said. She said, it's so easy to settle for less than God's best for us because we don't always feel like taking responsibility for our behavior or putting forth some effort to do what we need to do so we can accomplish great things for God and help people. But the cost of settling for less is actually harder than being completely obedient to God's will. I wonder if there are any areas of your life where you have settled for mediocrity. If there's any area of your life where you have convinced yourself that this is the most that the Lord wants for you. If you're just getting by every single month and you've told yourself, no, the Lord is teaching me a lesson that this is all that I can manage, so this is all I should expect. Or perhaps with your children or maybe your relationship with your parents, you know, I've just never been able to break through my relationship with my father and so I'm just gonna leave it over there. I'm not gonna try, there's no point. I, this is, mediocrity is all I'm gonna get. There's so many areas in life where because it's all we are used to, we start now try to change our theology to believe, well, this is what the Lord is trying to teach me, so this is what I'm gonna settle for. At least I have a meal on the table. At least I've still got my father. At least we're still married. No, we shouldn't be living in at least. We should be living in, Lord, what is more? What more do you have? What else do I need to step in? How do I need to grow to step in the more that you have for me? How do I need to grow as a disciple to grow my faith? What else do I need to do, Father God, so I don't settle for something that is mediocre? Church, keeping in mind that when God saw the need in our lives for salvation, he didn't respond with mediocrity. He responded by giving the very, very best. When he saw a need for a sacrifice that would atone for our sin and satisfy the righteous requirements of righteousness or the righteous requirements of the law, he didn't say, oh, go send one of the intern angels, they will do. No, he chose Jesus. He sent Jesus, God's 
only begotten son to come into the earth to live a human experience perfectly, who could empathize and relate to every single one of our weaknesses and pains, to die on the cross as a sacrifice of purity, to take the punishment that we deserved so that we could be made perfectly right with God the Father. And now salvation doesn't mean that we live with a version of hope. It means that we live with complete hope. We don't live with a measure of confidence about eternity. We live with complete confidence about eternity. God always does things excellently, even our salvation. And so as we come to a close today, I want to ask the question, if you've been living with a mediocre faith, with a lame expectation of God, or if you really have embraced the fullness of what he has, and maybe today you've settled in an area of your life. Maybe you've settled in your work or your marriage. Maybe you've settled with your addictions or your pain or your lack of good health, whatever it is. Maybe today I hope perhaps that there's been a part of you that says, Lord, I've settled, but I need to trust you for more. As we come to a close, why don't you take a moment now and just commit that to the Lord. Pray and say, God, I need help. Lord, I don't want to settle. This December, I don't want to settle for old habits and old addictions. I don't want to slip into an old way of life. I don't want to be like Terah who once had freedom but then settled into idol worship once again. Lord, I, I, want to, I want to maintain the momentum. I want to start next year off strong. Pray, commit that to the Lord. But also I want to pray for you today for your relationship with God. Because if you're here today and you've settled into having a a relationship of, with God that is based on guilt and shame, a relationship with Him that's based on your failings and your shortcomings, well, you've settled for something less because that's never what our relationship with God is meant to be like. And perhaps at one stage you were walking in strength with the Lord, but today you know that you are far from Him. Today needs to be the day where you say, Lord, I will not settle for less in my relationship with You. I have fallen far away from You. I have backslidden perhaps. I know that my heart has turned away from you. I recognize that I still need you, but I'm too afraid and too ashamed to come back to you. Today, decide that I will not settle for less. And we're gonna pray a prayer in a moment for you if that is you today. But also if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus before, maybe you've never responded to letting, the, uh, letting Jesus become the Lord of your life. I can tell you what, if you have settled for a human construction of your faith, if you've settled for a human process or a human journey, if you think that doing human things is gonna satisfy that emptiness inside, you have settled for a counterfeit of faith and spirituality. It is only through Jesus Christ that we are made right with God the Father. It is only through Jesus Christ that we will be in eternity with God one day. It's only through Jesus Christ that we truly deal with the condition of our lives. So don't settle for self-help books or just having a symbol around your neck or just thinking that you're doing okay because you meditate silently at home, praying to nothing. No, it's only through Jesus, through becoming a child of God, by making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, by handing over authority of your life to God through Jesus, by allowing Him to forgive you, to redeem you and restore you. That's how we have true faith. And so today, if you need to make that decision, if you'd like to accept Christ into your heart and into your life, or if you'd like to come back to Him because you've been running away, I'd love to pray for you. Even if you're at home and you feel a stirring inside, you feel like, yes, I need to make this decision. We're gonna pray a prayer in a moment. And for those who are here, I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes to give people a moment of privacy. And if that is you, all I'm gonna ask you to do on the count of three is to raise your hand. And I'm not gonna call you forward or take you to a side room or embarrass you in any way. All we're gonna do in a moment after you've raised your hand is pray a prayer, all of us together, a prayer of, pray, of faith to help you to begin this journey. Even at home, you can raise your hand as an act of faith. Even if you're sitting on yourself by yourself with your family, let this be a moment where you say, I'm not gonna settle for anything less. But if that's you, on the count of three, raise your hand and we're gonna pray. One, two, three. Slip it up. Let me see your hand and let's pray. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you under the balcony. Thank you down the front. Thank you over there all the way across. There's a number of hands that are responding. That's wonderful. Up at the balcony as well, I see a number of hands going up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see those hands over here down the middle. Thank you over there in the middle. I see those hands over to my right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Many people have responded today, church. Wonderful, wonderful. Our oh, common church, we should never settle for less. We should never settle for less than God's best for us. Never settle for a low, minimal faith or no faith. 
Never go through life without the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. One last call. Quickly slip up your hand, slip it down, and we're going to pray. Thank you at the back. I see those hands. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, church, let's pray this prayer, all of us. Let's pray out loud with confidence. Say, Dear Father, today I receive the gift of Jesus Christ. I decide now to make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. I acknowledge that He died on the cross for me. I acknowledge that He rose from death. And today I celebrate that one day when I die, He will raise me with Him to be in eternity with God the Father. Thank you, Lord, that today I have become a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, church, give those people a huge round of applause for the decision that they've made today. Fantastic. Well, just before you all jump out and head outside, I really want to encourage you, uh, if you made a decision, you can scan the QR code in the seat in front of you or on the screen as well. It'll take you to a webpage to give you a bit more information about the decision that you've made. And if you'd like somebody to get in touch with you, you're welcome to leave your details and we will be in touch. And then church, as we go through December, I want to encourage you, stay safe. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself, sanitize, wear your mask, get vaccinated if you haven't already done so, and keep in touch with social media with the mailers that we send out to see if there's any news about things that might be changing over December. We want to wait to see what government does, but let's pray and trust that we're going to have a December of strength. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next weekend.